Welcome everyone to the Exploratorium Observatory Gallery and to this very special talk tonight, which is part of our Ocean uh, Discovery Series. I'm really, really excited about tonight's program and this whole series of talks and activities we're doing here um, all month at the Exploratorium. It's really celebrating the ocean and our partnerships with, with scientists and agencies, especially our partnership with NOAA which you all may know is, stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We actually have a NOAA ship. You may have noticed there's a big, beautiful ship uh, outside the window. It's called the Reuben Lasker. Um, there are going to be public tours of the Reuben Lasker tomorrow. Um, you can sign up um, on, the, uh, on our website um, to get a, a tour. And I was on it today. It's an exciting ship. It uses a lot of, of technology. Um, to, to help uh, the folks at NOAA assess what the ecosystem is and to be able to make good decisions about uh, fisheries. There's also a team of scientists who um, are uh, identifying and counting marine mammals and birds, and they actually enter into this story. You're going to hear about that in a little bit. Um, and so you can go to the website, which is www.exploratorium.edu. Very easy website, go to the calendar and there'll be instructions on all of the activities we're doing this month um, and also about how to get on a, a tour of the Reuben Lasker. So tonight's talk is really special. Um, you're gonna hear all about how a small team, very trained team, go out in a rubber boat um, to help whales that have been entangled in fishing gear. As, as you can imagine, it's very tricky. It can be dangerous, which is why uh, these people go through a lot of training. And we're going to hear today from somebody who is actually on that response team. But what makes it really cool is the person who's giving the talk tonight is a colleague of mine here at the Exploratorium. Uh, Kathy George is a project manager in the Living Systems and the Environment team. We, we call it the lab here at the Exploratorium. In addition to her work at the museum, Kathy is a co-investigator on NOAA's Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program, and she's been trained and permitted to respond to the sightings of entangled whales. She's been part of the response team for six entanglements and also 50 sea lion entanglements, which I, you don't have pictures of that, but I want to hear about that. We'll have lunch. <laughs> Kathy is an avid diver, snorkeler, advocate for marine wildlife. She has a degree in industrial engineering from Purdue University, but she spends as much time as she can on boats and on the water, which I can relate to. <laughs> I also want to give a shout out today to the NOAA folks that are here from the Reuben Lasker. Um, as I said, there's a, a team of scientists on board who count and identify marine mammals and seabirds, and they're actually steaming down or motoring down from um, the Canadian coast down to San Francisco, and they spotted a whale that was entangled. They called the response team, and you're going to hear about how to do that if you see that. Um, and the response team uh, mobilized and went up to Eureka, and Kathy was on that response team. So you're going to hear about a very recent and late-breaking uh, response for an entangled whale. I'll let her tell you the story. It's amazing that it kind of converged here when we talked about this, you know, planned this talk a, a couple months ago. We knew the ship was coming, but we had no idea how relevant it was going to be. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my colleague, Kathy George. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'm really excited to be here to talk to all of you and excited to be a part of Ocean's Discovery Month here at the Exploratorium. As Mary mentioned, I've been involved in the marine mammal stranding entanglement world for 16 years now. I started off doing disentanglements of sea lions that were, had fishing gear or marine debris wrapped upon them, and I advanced and grew my skill set and became a responder with the NOAA network. And as I go through my presentation today, there's three things that I want you to keep in mind. Um, this is a video of an entangled humpback whale from Monterey earlier this year. If you do see an entanglement, all of you can play a role in that response. 
All you need to do is call 877-SOS-WHALE on your phone or call the Coast Guard on channel 16 and that activates the response network. Also, I want to highlight that the fishermen are not trying to catch whales. They are trying to catch their prey. So um, fish, no fisherman that I've ever talked to has tried to catch a whale. And a lot of what we're seeing has to do with changing ocean conditions. So I kind of want you to think about that as I go through the presentation. So the work for whale entanglement response is all done under the NOAA Fisheries Office of Protected Resources. It is a permitted team that goes out to respond to entanglements, and I really want to emphasize team. There are a lot of people involved in entanglement response. In this photo, you can see three people on a small boat. We call that the cut boat, and those are the people that are going to be approaching the whale. Those are the people with the most experience and that have the permit to do so. And we'll have other boats there for support and for safety. And they'll also play key roles like communications with shore, communications with media, communications with the NOAA network. They'll be doing photo and video documentation. They'll be documenting the behaviors of the whale and observing what's going on in the environment around us to ensure the safety of the people. So when we're out there, you may see videos or photos in the news of one or two people, it really is a team effort and a collaboration to be successful. We use specialized tools. I brought a few of them up here, so I encourage you to come take a look at the end. But we have special knives that are curved and blunt on the outside, so if you do touch the whale, you're not gonna cause additional harm. They're incredibly sharp on the inside, so if you do come up here, please don't touch this part of the tool. And this big yellow thing is a telemetry buoy, and that is an example of the telemetry buoy over there. This is the satellite tag that fits in the snorkel, the gray tube coming off of the top of it. And this sends out a signal to a satellite, and we can get a position of the whale every hour. It also has radio telemetry in it, so when we are on site in that we need that most recent position, we could use the radio telemetry to help us actually locate the position of the whale. And we do all of our response work under the ICS system, which is an organized way to handle a response and be efficient. There's different sections of the response, there's different roles that people play, and everyone in ICS is very familiar with it. So everyone knows what their portion is to do to help support the response, whether it's operations, logistics, finance, communications. It's really an organized system, and it, the federal government uses it for emergency management procedures as well. These are a few of the most commonly reported whales off of our coastline. Humpback whales, gray whales in the middle that have the mottled coloring, and then the blue whale, the largest animal on Earth right now. We've seen an uptick in reports of these species. We've also had reports of minkies, orcas, fin whales, and on the bottom right is the North Pacific right whale, which is incredibly endangered, and I believe there's less than 30 of them, but I may stand corrected by some of my colleagues here in the audience but um, there has been a sighting of this whale off of San Diego earlier this summer. So um, very few sightings of them and very few individuals left. So if this particular whale gets entangled, there's going to be a lot of activity around it. I'm gonna focus on the humpback whale, not just because it's my favorite whale, but it's the whale that I work with most frequently. Humpback whales can weigh 90,000 pounds, that's 600 people at 150 pounds. They can grow up to 40 to 50 feet, which is about half the length of this room, plus some. Their peck fins, which are, okay. <laughs> the peck fins right here, they can grow up to 16 feet. This here is 18 feet right here. So this is a really large animal that we're working with. And I want to highlight just a few parts of the anatomy that I'll be talking about in the presentation. So I mentioned pec fin. Up on the top in the back up here is the dorsal fin. This area is the peduncle. And then the tail or the fluke. So I'll be talking about these different parts of the body as I start talking about the responses on the whale. 
Every humpback whale can be identified by their tail print or their fluke print. Um, there's different pigmentations with black and white and different scarring can occur, whether from barnacles or from the teeth of killer whales. Those rake marks that you see are actually killer whale teeth that have grabbed a hold of this particular humpback whale. But this is the primary means of identification for a humpback whale. On a really exciting part, humpback whale populations are growing. We've done a really good job with our conservation efforts since the whaling days, and we have a lot more humpback whales off our coast. This map that you see up here was put together by NOAA, and the blue circles are, there's 14 different populations of humpback whales, and a different population of humpback whale would go from a different breeding area to a different feeding area. So they breed in warm water, and they feed in cold, productive waters. And what I want to highlight here is that the blue is not endangered, the yellow is threatened, and the pinkish and red color is endangered. And the whales off of Mexico and Central America come to California for feeding. And those particular populations are endangered and threatened. There is no way to tell if a whale is endangered or threatened by looking at it. You need genetics but this all goes into decisions when we're out there to respond to whales. Some of the, mentioned that we have growing whale populations, we also have growing human populations. And one of the threats to whales is fishing gear. This is Dungeness crab trap gear, and most of the entanglement reports we get we don't know what type of fishery is involved because there's no identification. The report is there was a line or there was a buoy on the whale, and we can't pinpoint a particular fishery with just that minimal amount of information. The Dungeness crab fishery requires a tag on their first buoy there. And so when we do get reports of gear that's identified, it's most often Dungeness crab gear because they're required to mark all of their gear. Not all other trap fisheries are required to mark their gear. And so we're working on legislation right now with the state to make that mandatory for all trap gear to have some type of identifying mark on so we know what, fishing, what fishery it's coming from. So Dungeness crab gear, the pot will sit on the seafloor. That line goes vertical to the surface to that buoy, and some fishermen will add an extra length of line with another buoy on it here. In case this buoy goes underwater, this buoy will still remain visible. So in a big swell, a big current, they could lose sight of the main buoy, and then the trailer buoy is visible. And this is what we're seeing a lot of humpback whales get entangled in. Another type of trap gear that we've seen entanglements reported in is coonstripe gear, and the way that coonstripe shrimp, and the way that gear is set up is there's a vertical line again with a buoy at the surface, down to a sea anchor, with a string across the bottom, and multiple pots set along that string with another buoy to the surface and another sea anchor at this end. So a different kind of setup. And we don't know how and why whales are getting entangled. We don't have a lab we can go put them in and try out different conditions. We do know that there can be a lot of gear in some areas at certain times of the year. Humpback whales are also very curious. They will go up to gear, they'll approach it, they'll play with it, and sometimes it gets caught on them and they don't have arms to take it off, so they breach, they roll, they throw, and they can end up entangling themselves more, or the gear could come off of them. In this case, this particular humpback whale, humpback whales are baleen whales. Baleen whales have two blowholes, which are right in the middle there. Toothed whales have one blowhole. But this particular whale was able to free itself. Sometimes, however, we need to go out and respond. And in that case, we do all of our responses from boats. It is illegal to get in the water when you are doing a disentanglement effort, and all of this work is done under permit, so nobody, please, you all are a member of the response network now. You know what to do if you see a whale. Call 877-SOS-WHALE. You're part of the network, but please don't go out there and attempt any of this yourself. <laughs> Thank you.
back in the day. Keep it afloat at the surface as much as possible. And when the whale runs, it does pull the line. We don't lock our gear, we don't lock that, our line hard. But they call this a Nantucket sleigh ride when, you're, when the whale is pulling your boat through the water. And you'll see that in some of the videos that I'm going to share where the whale is actually pulling us through the water. And we do that for safety reasons. So I'm going to talk about a response in, on April 27th in 2014 down in Moss Landing, California. Monterey Bay Whale Watch was out looking at whales and one of the naturalists noticed this set of buoys moving consistently with a whale. She called the response network and activated a response. They were able to get photo documentation, which is really important. The top photo there is the dorsal fin of the humpback whale. That can sometimes be used as a secondary way to identify the whale. The fluke is the main way, but the dorsal fin can help with the identification. In the middle is a shot with the humpback whale and the gear, so we can estimate what the entanglement looks like at the surface. And at the bottom shot are the buoys that were on the whale. And that information is collected and shared with the Department of Fish and Wildlife as well as NOAA, so they can contact the fishermen and hopefully learn more about when they set the gear, where they set the gear, how their gear was set up, because all of that information will help us work on the prevention side. An absolute key to the success of this response was the whale watch boat standing by. We're pretty fortunate that when a entangled whale is reported in Monterey, there are a number of whale watching boats that are always on the water and basically a whale watch boat will come over and babysit the entangled humpback whale until a response team can arrive. The hardest thing in disentanglement is finding the whale. Often these whales are free swimming, they're carrying the gear with them. So if they're reported in one location and hours pass until a response team can get on site, the whale may have moved and you can spend hours out there, days out there searching for whales with or without success. So one thing that made this response successful was the cooperation of the whale watching boats and standing by until a response team arrived on site. The next thing we do is put a satellite, er, in this case we put a satellite tag on the whale. And the reason we did that, it was getting late in the day you don't want to rush an entanglement. You don't want to get out there and just start cutting things. You may only have one chance, so you need to understand the whole picture. So we put a satellite tag, which in this case is the green buoy in the middle, right below me, which is similar to that white one over there. So that way we could relocate the whale the next day when we would go out and respond to it. When we go out and respond to it, I mentioned we want to understand what the entanglement looks like. You can only see so much from the surface. And unfortunately, in Monterey Bay, you can only see so much below the surface as well. So this is a photo from a GoPro. What we'll do is in our small boat, we approach the whale from behind, and all of the trailing gear will grab a hold of it, and we'll lift our engine up out of the water because we don't want to become part of the entanglement. And we'll walk hand over hand on that line until we can get as close to the tail as, pos as safely possible, and we'll hold ourselves there. And we use these poles, oops, you're welcome to come up and grab them later. They're made out of carbon fiber, so they're pretty light. And we have two more extensions, they're six feet each, so they could reach out 30 feet. And we put a camera at the end, and we go over the whale, under the whale, and get as much video we can so we can understand the complexity of the entanglement. In this case, you can see this is the peduncle area, so the tail is kind of going down on the sides, and you can see the green line in there. So there's three wraps of green line. You can see 
The white part is necrotic tissue, so it's starting to get into the whale's tail area. And even better, underneath the whale, this, everybody see a whale? <laughs> so underneath the whale, on the far right side, you can see kind of a faint green line, and there's a bunch of twisting, and you see two lines coming down. One of those lines is going down to a pot, and the other line was going to those buoys that were trailing behind the whale. So seeing this footage, we made a plan to go out the next day, let's pull up the crab pot and release that weight, and we'll get that off and out of the water and not add any more marine debris, and then we'll untwist those lines, and hopefully won't, we won't even have to cut on that embedded line. So we went out the next day, and as you can see from my face, it's very hard work to pull up a crab pot at depth, but we managed to get the crab pot out of the water, and we used a boat hook. So you can see that we're holding on to the line that's coming off the whale. We're staying kind of behind the whale, which is our safety zone, and we're using a boat hook to try and get that one line from underneath the fluke blade to on top of it. However, the weather turned on us, and we had to unfortunately end the operations for the day for safety reasons. But we had the satellite tag on the whale, and we were waiting for the whale to get into a position where we could safely respond, and the whale traveled south. That's Monterey Bay in the far left photo, and the whale started traveling south along the Big Sur coast and we had no place to launch a small boat, and the big boats, it was too far of a put-in distance to travel to where the whale was. So we had to wait until the whale got into a better position for us to respond. Still, day six through eight, the whale kept swimming south. It's down near San Simeon, Hearst Castle, Cambrian area, excuse me, Cambria area, and again, we did not have a good launch point to go out and respond. Day nine, we're ready to respond. We have all of our gear ready to go, teams in place, and the whale is in Morro Bay, an easy location to access the whale. All ready to go, and unfortunately, the weather turned on us again. So day 12 and 13, we're kind of, we all have day jobs, so we're all volunteers in this network when we go out and do this effort. So go back to our day jobs, waiting, and the whale is in Santa Barbara. And we think we have a window. So the team gets together from the Bay Area. We drive our boats all the way down to Santa Barbara after work one day, sleep for a few hours on the boat, get up at 0500, ready to respond. And the whale moved slightly out of the range that the boat could safely reach, and the weather picked up. So we had to turn around and drive back to the Bay Area. And we kept watching the track, and where is the whale going to be next? And finally, on day 18, everything aligned. The conditions were great. The whale is really close to Santa Barbara. It's in the Santa Barbara Channel. We have many trained responders that are able to get up there. We had teams from the Bay Area, we had teams from LA, and we had teams from San Diego that came up to help with the response. We had a nice and early start at 4 a.m. We work in small boats, and the particular small boat that we worked with on this occasion was an inflatable boat. So we worked with the National Marine Sanctuary out of the Channel Islands and their boat Shearwater, and we put our small inflatable on their boat, inflated it with a scuba tank, got all our gear ready, and went out to find the whale. In this photo, Justin Vizbicki, who is holding the antenna with the radio tracking on it. He is the stranding coordinator for the west coast of California. He's in charge of determining when a response happens. But he was able to come out in the response. We use radio telemetry to locate the whale. I mentioned we have the satellite position, which is every month, or sorry, every month. That would be a really hard time to find a whale <laughs> every hour. But um, we were able to locate that. We also used good old-fashioned binoculars, and in this case, the binoculars worked very quickly. And we found our whale. As you can see, the conditions are great. We knew the injury was on the tail area of the peduncle, 
So we wanted to put more flotation on the whale's tail area to lift it and to keep, keep, the whale, keep that area at the surface so we could work on it. So those red buoys, you can see our engine is up out of the water because we don't want to become part of the entanglement. And what we're doing is grabbing that working line again. We'll motor up to the line, grab the line, turn off the engine, lift it. And then for those of you that are into knots, we use prussic loops and we'll attach a carabiner on one of those with a buoy. And then we slide the prussic loop closer and closer until we're at a safe distance. So that's what the team is doing here. And this is the first time we did a two boat response in the network. So we had one, blade, one of the lines that was going over the top of the fluke and one of the lines that's going underneath the fluke. So what we're doing here is I'm holding the line on the right and we're gonna have the team on the left use that boat, ho boat hook and flip the line over to the top. And here's a video of that happening. So you can see the condition of the peduncle has changed significantly. There's a lot more necrotic tissue on there. Um, you can see the other line coming up. You may see flashes of the pec fin. They call that sculling with the whale kind of swimming through the water with its pec fin. The whale at this point is pretty tired and just slowly moving at the surface. It's also pulling the weight of two boats. So the whale is not moving very actively. But here comes the line over the top. And you're going to see the line come together. We were hoping that this would be an unwrap and we could do that a couple times, but the line stops right there. And we can see from the boat that there's actually a knot in the line, and we can't unwrap it. So with that knot, we're going to make a cut. And that's Peter Fulkins that has the pole, he's one of the lead responders here in the network, and that was the cut right there. So he took this knife at the end of one of these poles, you screw it in, it's dull on the outside so you don't cause any damage if you touch the whale. It's extremely sharp in here. You may cut your finger or your eyes if you look too closely, so be, be careful. But he saw where the knot was, inserted the pole in the water, and made the cut. So this is above the water. The next slide I'm going to show you is from under the water. And I will say that be, there may be a, there's a little bit of blood in the water with this per, next video. And that is actually a good thing. It means there's still blood going to the tail and the whale hasn't lost its tail yet. But this is what the cut looked like from under the water. So if you look in there, you can see the knot right there is the knot. You can also see part of the vertebrae. And, but then you'll see the knife come into the pitcher and it will touch that knot without touching anything else and the cut's made and the knot is gone. So now the whale has one line coming off this side of the blade, of the fluke blade and one line off the other side. And one boat is holding the line on the right, and one boat's holding the line on the left. And the whale's just dragging us at this point. And about right now, the line is going to break and come off the whale. Shortly after this, the line came off the other side. And the other boat went up and approached the whale and did some photo and video analysis and confirmed that all the gear came off of the whale. So we had successfully saved this whale and got all of the gear off. And this is a shot of the team of the people that were involved in the disentanglement. And I will say we are not sponsored by Kind Bar, minus all of that. But if Kind Bar is watching on Facebook, we welcome the opportunity to be sponsored by Kind or anyone else that's listening. Um, give me a call. My email was on the first slide. But here is the track of the whale. It started in Moss Landing, and it swam all the way down to the Channel Islands, over 610 nautical miles that it carried this entanglement 
with the satellite tag on it. I think I drove 900 miles during this response, but um, the whale definitely had it worse than I did. And uh, another graphic slide, sorry, forgot that warning. But 39 days after we did the disentanglement, we got a call from the stranding network that a dead humpback whale washed up with an injury in the same area of the whale that we disentangled. Fortunately, we had good documentation at the start and had the photos of the dorsal fin and were able to compare that to this whale and determine that this was not the same whale. So we were relieved on that part, but we never know for sure what happens after we disentangle a whale. Well, in this particular case, 48 days and 100 yards from where it was first sighted and tangled, the, a volunteer team from Marine Life Studies found the whale that we disentangled, and you can see that its injury is starting to heal. There is a little divot where the scarring is, but it looks great compared to what it did 30, 48 days earlier, and the whale was feeding and with other humpback whales, so we feel that this whale has a good chance of success. And this is just one example. Every, different, every whale rescue is different. This particular scenario was from April of 2016, we talked about the Nantucket sleigh ride and kind of holding the whale from behind. This was a recently entangled whale, and recently entangled whales are very active. So we were holding the whale from behind, and it started swimming in circles and swinging us out to the side, and we couldn't make our cuts the way that we needed to in approaches. So we, Scott Benson from NOAA Fisheries Southwest Science Center is driving the boat, and he's paralleling the track of the whale and Ryan Berger from the Marine Mammal Center is on point there, and he's holding this pole set with, I believe, 30 feet of length. This is 18 feet, so we're in a small rubber boat um, in seas and holding this, and he's positioning that, uh, a knife over there that I'll show you later, where the whale, he, we know what the whale's, the whale's gonna come up and breathe and dive back down and keep traveling. So we anticipated when the whale would come up and when the whale would go down, and he positioned the knife where the whale would dive, and he was able to make a cut of one of the lines that was right there is when the cut happens. So he was able to successfully make that cut. This particular, that cut we made, we did all the analysis beforehand, and this is kind of a in-process video, but and a little dizzying because you're on a GoPro, but I wanted to show all of you kind of what it's like from the response boat. But um, this particular whale required one more cut that we successfully did from behind the whale, and all of the gear was removed from this whale. This one's just a photo, but this was last year in Crescent City, and this was a, another humpback whale that had swam through 15 sets of gear with 15 traps on each set. So it was anchored in one place and wasn't moving. There was so much weight from all of the traps that were on this particular one. But this rescue was extremely successful because of the involvement of the fishermen in the network. And we, there was a series of cuts that were made because the whale had a very complex entanglement and had been reduced. And the remaining gear on this whale was in that same area. Kind of gear comes down the whale and because the tail widens, it can't go any further, it gets stuck right there. But in this particular case, you can see the rescue team on the small boat on the side with the pole out with the knife ready to make the cut. But we, we added buoys to bring the tail up. We didn't have enough buoys to bring the tail up. So we worked with the fishermen and we had permission from NOAA throughout this entire process that the fishermen winched up some of the gear to relieve some of the weight and allow the tail to come up and the cut was successfully made. So a great success story with the fishermen. And just recently, Wednesday in fact, we got a report of an entangled, or sorry, Tuesday, we'd gotten a call of an entangled whale from the Reuben Lasker, and Juan Carlos, who is sitting over here, can you wave hi? He, si yeah, he deserves a big hand. He actually cited an entangled whale and helped mount an entanglement response. So he cited it from the Reuben Lasker that's docked right outside and contacted the network. 
network, got in touch with two researchers from Cascadia Research who were out doing some t whale research and tagging work. And they put on a telemetry buoy on the whale. So we were able to relocate that whale really easily because we could find it with the telemetry. And in this photo, you can see the whale there. You can see its injury on its tail. And it's what well, I'll explain the video in a second. But um, what we're doing here when you can see a support boat out there, the whale is up there. We had a telemetry on it. The current was going in the opposite direction. So the current was at the telemetry buoy, which would be our normal place that we would grab and work from, was at the head of the whale. And we didn't want that to, you can see it up there on the left corner right there. So that's the telemetry buoy, and it's at the head. So we don't want that, we want to reduce that and get that out of the way so the whale doesn't get entangled in it. So what we're doing right here is throwing a grapple, which is that tool right there, into the entanglement on the line. Kind of like Moby Dick, they harpooned it. That's our harpoon for grabbing the gear that's coming off of the whale. So we grabbed, we grabbed that gear and we walked up close to the whale. And kind of hand over hand, you can see our boats up out of the water. There are three different buoys on this particular whale. And in the video clip coming up, you'll see what we're gonna do is take the telemetry buoy is carabinered into one of the loops on top of those buoys. So we're gonna take that off. And here's Ryan, this is throwing the grapple and how we attach and the other video that you, part of the video that you may have seen is us starting to pull up the crab pot. So this was a immensely successful rescue again because of all the team effort involved. It, from the Reuben Lasker to sighting the whale to Cascadia putting on the telemetry buoy to the NOAA trained whale entanglement response teams that went up there and did the disentanglement. So after, I think it's gone through a couple times, I'll go ahead and jump forward, but this was an incredibly successful rescue and hopefully we'll be hearing some more about this in the news. I know NOAA is going to be sending out a press release shortly on this particular rescue. So I've showed you four successful rescues, and not every rescue is successful in terms of getting all gear off of the whale. We define success in many different ways. Success could be getting the photo documentation of the whale and the entanglement, and we could learn from that information. We can learn what species are getting entangled, where are they getting entangled on their body, what type of gear is entangling them, um, what age are they? So there's a lot of information that we could get from photos and documentation because all of that information is shared with people that are working on mitigation efforts. So that is a success, getting a photo, identifying an entanglement, as well as getting all of the gear off. And the most important thing in all of this is human safety. We don't want to put any person in risk of getting injured. And while I showed you, I mentioned those four successes, these are some statistics for the last four years on entanglement reports and the outcomes of them. What I really want to highlight is that there are a lot more reported entanglements than successful entanglements. So not every whale is able to get rescued, but we can learn from every entanglement that we see. So for example, in 2017, we had 41 reports of entangled whales, and only nine of those were disentangled, or the whale was able to throw the gear itself. And this is why the prevention side is really important, and the rescue side is the Band-Aid fix. It saves a whale, which is wonderful. We can all feel good in some species that one whale may have a difference on the whole population, but really efforts need to be made on the mitigation side. And I'm on a working group with the state of California and the Dungeness Crab Task Force Whale Entanglement Working Group, and we're a group of 19 people. The working group was started by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and the Ocean Protection Council. And over half of the team is fishermen. We have commercial and recreational fishermen. We have members of the Disentanglement Response Network. We have nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and Oceana and Earth Justice. 
And we're all coming to the table together to discuss ways of how we can reduce the risk of entanglement. And I don't have any photos of the team, I really wish I did, but you can go online, if you Google whale entanglement working group, it'll take you to the Ocean Protection Council's website and you can learn more information there. But some of the products that we produced from the working group are a best practices guide. So we showed the fishermen the photos of the entanglements and they were able to look at them and understand how gear may have been set up and why, why is there so much line between these two different buoys? So we asked them, by depth, what is the best gear setup? And they helped tell us, and there we produced the best practices guide. I think this is the third version of it now. And we've given it out to all fishermen in all ports. It's been mailed to them. We're now working on making this legislation and policy that you can't, that the standards that are produced have to be followed or there could be consequences for it. So this is one of the outcomes of the working group. One other thing that we're doing is we're trying, we're working with researchers like Jared Santora from Santa Cruz to understand where the prey of the whales are. And we could then understand where the whales will be and share that information with the fishermen ahead of time so perhaps they could avoid setting their gear in certain areas. This map here is looking at krill hotspots. The Reuben Lasker, again, they go out and do rockfish surveys and that data is used by Jared along with other data sets to understand where the krill are. And krill are related to upwelling. If we have good, strong upwelling years, we'll have good krill years. Humpback whales can feed on krill or they can feed on anchovies. When they feed on krill, they're further offshore and not where all the fishing is happening. If the krill isn't there, they're gonna feed on anchovies, which is closer to shore and where the fishing is happening. So trying to look at different factors. We're also looking at where the whales are at certain times of year. And we created a program called RAMP, which is the Risk Assessment and Mitigation Program. And there's a lot on the screen. You don't have to read everything that's on here, but what I wanna highlight, there's four things that we're looking at. And I, one of those is the delay to the fishing season. Going back to ocean conditions, we've had increases in domoic acid, toxicity and delays to the fishing season that have impacted things. So kind of changing ocean conditions and any delays to the fishing season. So one is fishing season delay. Two is forage. Are the, is the krill good or is the krill bad? Are the whales gonna be feeding on fish or anchovies? Whales, where are the whales at? Do we have a lot of whales in any particular areas that are fishing hot spots? And also looking at entanglements. Have we had any reported entanglements in the Dungeness crab fishery late, lately? And if any one of these factors are said yes, or if in the case of krill, if it's a low krill year, an evaluation team comes together and they go out and they get more information on whichever one of those factors that has been raised. And they'll evaluate it and they're gonna make a recommendation to the director of fish and wildlife. It may be simply that all the fishermen need to use best practices, it's required to be best practices, or it may be we need to close a certain area of the fishery for a certain period of time until those conditions change. So um, this program has gone through two voluntary seasons with the fishermen and we'll be doing it again in November, and we're also working on making this legislation as well, so kind of defining what the management actions are. And it's really heartening for me to be at the table with such a diverse group of stakeholders and the fishermen whose livelihoods are at stake, and they're the ones that are saying it's okay to close certain areas for certain time periods. So this is really important work that's being done on the mitigation side and I'm really excited to be a part of the team that's doing that. And I just want to thank all the groups that are involved in the Whale Entanglement Response Network. They're listed on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side are the groups that are involved in the working group. And with that, thank you for your time, and I am open to any questions that you have. <laughs>